everyone. Welcome to the COVID Calls. I am your host, Ryan Pyle, and this is my Instagram Live, and I am coming to you from Istanbul, which is the home of the COVID Calls. And I want to thank everyone for uh, joining today. How am I doing? Not too bad. Not too bad. Keeping busy. Keeping very busy. Today on the show, I've got Dr. Jeremy Butler, psychiatrist. And disclaimer, he's also my cousin. But he's been keeping me company during these challenging times, and he always has a lot of interesting, th interesting things to say um, about life in the Oakville, Toronto area in Canada, which is where he lives, uh, and just what's going on. And sometimes he gives me some mental health tips on how you can avoid being lonely during lockdown. So uh, Jeremy is waiting, and let's bring him on in and have a conversation with my cousin, also Dr. Jeremy Butler. Here we go. Waiting, 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 waiting. Ding, ding. Hey, buddy, how you doing? Good morning, sir. How are you? Or well, morning, my time. What time is it where you are? Uh, three, three p.m. in the afternoon. Still, uh, still on okay. coffee and water. If that's what you really need to know. There you go. There you go. So, how, how have you been, buddy? I'm doing well, man. Yeah. yeah. It's uh, things are starting to open up back here. So I feel like, you know, the tide is receding and uh, and and sort of you can kind of see a light at the end of the tunnel. I don't think it feels like we're just uh, treading water anymore. Hopefully uh, things are moving forward. So uh, starting to get that little bit of glimmer of hope that you sort of survived this as opposed to just being mired in the middle phase of it. So, yeah, what about you. Um, yeah, I'm I'm OK. Um... I was talking to myself the other day on a podcast that I was recording. And I was saying, yeah, I just talk to myself all the time. It's not healthy. No, it's not healthy. Not healthy. But, um, <laughs> but I, well, first of all, let me say, I appreciate you. This is your third time uh, doing these calls with me. And uh, every, every one of them, I always feel happier at the end of it. Not, <laughs> not only because of, because I get to hang out with my cousin <laughs> online and in a, in a public forum. Um, but also some of the tips you've given me have been super helpful. Um, but oh, good. But yeah, so here in Istanbul, I feel like now I'm entering like my third phase of whatever this lockdown okay. has been. So the first phase was just uncertainty. And, yep. and, um, and I think that was like the Netflix and drinking stage. And then, and then the second, <laughs> the second phase was like rescue a cat, a kitten <laughs> and, and start doing these calls. And, and then moving out of the hotel and getting an apartment where I could kind of feel like I was living a normal life. Yeah. And then now I'm into stage three. And this is my own psychological evaluation and interpretation. Okay. And now I'm into right. stage three where yeah. I'm actually in a position to start planning my exit. Um, okay. And it looks like borders with Turkey and the rest of the EU are going to open up in July. And it looks like there might even be a chance where I could film in Switzerland in August because it's actually uh, an adventure trekking show. So very focused on social distancing. And um, of course. yeah, so that's what, that's kind of been my progression since the last time we've talked. You know, what it reminds me of a little bit is like a, a jail, right? Like, you know, when you see people who go to prison, you know, those first couple days are just such intense despair and desperation yeah. and then you kind of get you a sense of the ropes and then it's like all right it's time to plan my exit or escape right so uh, you haven't been you to finally you haven't been so, to jail though have you um well I, look i did forensic training so i used to work in prisons a fair amount so uh that was what you were doing uh, spent in a fair amount of time yeah yeah, yeah. i remember so that. uh so i been the old rikers i guess and all that kind of stuff you know back uh some years ago now but uh uh, have spent some time in prisons just to see that 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 plot arc, which is pretty dark when you're when you're in there. So yeah, I think uh, so. Switzerland, though. Yeah, doing the Alps, or what would you be doing? Yeah, so um, we we have a deal with uh, some people there to do a 380 kilometer, 30 day trek, um, all the way across Switzerland from the border uh, from east to west. So we're going to go from the border of Switzerland and Austria. Okay all the way to Mont yeah. Montreux on Lake Geneva. And that'll be, okay. uh, fingers crossed, how I spend my August. Oh my Lord, that's fantastic. I mean, Switzerland's beautiful. It is. So if you had to pick some place to walk along, um, but hilly, hilly. that's a- uh, 
it'll be yeah. it'll be physical. <laughs> Um, <laughs> well, I, I mean, but you've got to like bulk up and train then, I guess. I mean, you go from sitting inside watching Netflix for three months just to, to walking 400 kilometers. That's I've been, uh, I've been, you're up for this. I've been training every day, actually. So I, I have a, okay. I've, I put in a fitness routine after week two, um, when I knew that this was okay. going to be a while. So I trained for like 30 minutes every morning. So I'm feeling pretty strong, actually. I think, I think the cardio is what's missing. But um, yeah, but my muscles are all you know really well maintained. I suppose it's just going to be those few first days, and then getting used to alt- altitude again because it's been uh, it's been months since I've been at altitude. Because I think at, in in Istanbul, I'm almost down at sea level. Yeah. No. Well, in Switzerland, I'd have to imagine you'd be probably walking through lots of villages too. You wouldn't have to carry as much stuff. No. Or, you know, as you have in some of your, like your. Mountain tracks, certainly. No, so. no yaks or donkeys carrying uh, our bags and camera gear <laughs> back, back. But look, uh, I just I wanted to know, like, what's going on in Oakville? What's going on in Toronto? Um, you know, is has Toronto fully reopened? I mean, what's the news? So at the moment, um, so uh, where I'm at in, in Oakville, uh, Oakville and Hamilton has just I've just gotten the, the go ahead to enter phase two, basically two days ago. So uh, the GTA and Mississauga and some of the Brampton are still kind of in lockdown. Uh, but now we're allowed to have hair salons open and I guess restaurants. I have not yet partaken of those, as you can tell, but uh, we will we'll see what, uh, what the world has to offer as it reopens. But malls and things are supposed to slowly open and uh, with, with distancing and masks or certainly hand hygiene and everything else. Um, but no, Toronto, I think is still just because of the density. They had a few sort of spikes and, or small spikes. The numbers in, in Ontario at the moment are about 180 new cases a day. Um, but, uh, th- those are pretty much pockets around the GTA as opposed to it being widespread and everywhere else. Okay. So I, I think they've done a pretty great job of containing it, except for some of the nursing home outbreaks that have been devastating to those local you know, groups. Uh, so, um, so slowly the hospital is about to, to start to back to considering elective surgeries and hopefully, you know, things are able to get back underway for people that have been waiting a long time now for whatever uh, surgical procedure they've been waiting for. Yeah. Um, but they have to be very conscious about if there's a spike in cases, you know, do they have the resources to be able to, to bounce, swing back to, to treat those as opposed to um, you know, boxing out all beds with, with elective procedures. And things. So, uh, it makes for some challenging problem solving when you, when you hear them having to talk about how do you, how do you plan resources and keep a buffer zone and make sure that you can look after everybody who's going to need it and be able to pivot on a dime if you have to. So. Ter- terrifying. Um, otherwise, I think school's ending. Kids are, I'm not sure what they're going to do all summer. Uh, and pools. Cool. Uh, pretty much every teenager I talk to is sort of quietly cheating the rules, which, you know, I sort of have to slap them on the wrist for i guess a little bit but i think parents at this point are just uh, not sure what to say about any of this anymore no i mean i had uh i had um one friend tell me that his kids have obviously been home for like three months and they've just turned into mush and he actually used that word yeah. mush uh because they've just been in, inside staring at screens for months on end and uh so what's it yeah. what's it like actually working at the hospital these days because you're you're you i mean you work at a hospital i mean what's the that's right. Yeah, I mean, I mean, are people starting to relax a little bit, or or are things still just as stringent as they were three months ago? They're they're pretty much just as stringent as they were a few months ago. So um, you're right. I I'm uh, I, I practice emergency psychiatry, so I spend a lot of my time in the emergency room, um, and and the emergency room volumes in general are much smaller. Uh, probably much fewer car accidents, much fewer uh, you know slip and falls and sutures. Just people staying indoors and not exerting themselves. So there's been a huge drop, at least perceived in heart attacks, all kinds of conditions. Wow. Um, and, and for mental health, you know, we still see, see obviously people who are violent, suicidal, uh, substance use, um, fewer of the sort of just smaller complaints. You know, people aren't walking in just to get referral to someone. Uh, they're, they're, they're really in crisis and in pretty bad places. So those volumes are still down, but, but you're right. It feels like an alien environment. Everybody's in scrubs, everywhere's in face shield and mask. Um, you know, to be practicing mental health, you know, you get to look at somebody's eyes, but it's very much, uh, it's challenging to, to read the room and to know what somebody's feeling and thinking and whether they that they're really listening to you or whether you're really listening to them. It creates this sort of slight little paranoid kind of version of things. Um, 
and and a lot of people are are doing remote work if they can, you know, telephone calls and video conferencing as opposed to face to face things. But for emergencies, look, they're emergencies. You need to see someone in the room. You need to have them in a safe environment. So. Um, my job sort of is the same thing, just with new uh, new gear and new outfits. More more plastic. More plastic. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, I've been wearing this uh, <laughs> because you have to wear it all day and you don't want to touch it. I've got this sort of like big welder's helmet one that flips up as opposed to the little disposable ones that everyone's been wearing. So, do you, do you have a picture? Uh, I, I do you have a every, picture every, of any of this stuff that I, I this? Yeah, I, I'll work on it for the so I can put it on Instagram if there's another and show one of, everyone how yeah. crazy you are. Yeah, no, exactly. It's, it's this big, you know, yeah, it strikes a pose. I look like I'm going into a mine, um, but uh, whatever. Whatever keeps you safe and healthy. Yeah, well, that's it. I've, I've had two patients that I've seen who have ended up testing positive a few days later. So oh, wow. you get sort of these little following phone calls and go, oh, you know, Jesus, does that mean that I'm going to get it? You know, and you're sort of monitoring your temperature for a few days and trying to be conscious of who you're around. But, you know, Thankfully, they've all been in situations where I, I've been using PPE, and so it's not like I've had direct exposure and uh, did get tested and tested negative. But it's a harrowing kind of experience when you think of, holy crap, have I, did I get it and asymptomatically spread it to the next, you know, 20, 30 patients that I saw over the last, you know, couple of days. Then bringing it home to your kids and wife, like that's the crazy thing, right? Yeah. That's a, that, all of that, right? Yeah. Um, I mean, my, my, my wife and kids are pretty self-contained, you know? I mean, I think the concern here is not so much like I said to you before, that I'm terrified of getting COVID or that they're terrified of getting COVID. It's really, really trying to stop the spread of it to, to more vulnerable populations. So um, I don't, I don't live in fear about getting it, but certainly just, I live in fear that I'm going to pass it on to some, you know, 90 year old, you know, or somebody who's in a group home or a, or a living facility that there's a congregant living and can pass it on. So it's, it's wild. Yeah. I, so, I mean, Something you told me the first time we talked, like literally like three months ago, probably, was yeah. was that um, like people were just staying away from hospitals um, because like mm-hmm. hospitals were a place where people were getting sick and yeah. and spreading it and doctors were getting sick and nurses were getting sick. And obviously that was probably the most fearful time. But I'm wondering like when people are going to start counting the cost of turning people away from hospitals who didn't have COVID who, you know, had maybe minor issues that are now major or, or, you know, people who are coming in for elective surgeries and now have serious issues, or maybe even some of your potential mental health patients that maybe had Mm -hmm. minor issues at the beginning, but three months later have gone into a very dark place. And now they, you know, now they don't even know what to do with themselves. Like I, I'm like, this has overwhelmed us all so much that, like at some stage when we can start seeing our way out of it, which is maybe where we are now. I'm wondering yeah. how people are going to start counting, you know, the cost of this hundred percent all resources to COVID-19 um, movement that yeah. we've been in. Well, I mean, I think you're right. I mean, especially, the, you know, when, when this is first going down and you're looking at Italy or you're looking at United Kingdom, you're looking at New York city and you're just sort of seeing, you know, these exhausted healthcare workers that are just, you know, working these extensive shifts and not enough PPE and just having to sort of stay, you know, gowned up and masked up all day long and watching their colleagues fall just because it was so prevalent. Um, you know, we didn't get that here. Um, and, and you're right, as we sort of transition to community spread, it's not really about hospitals being a hotbed of exposure, potentially. It's really about other places um, really being around and being spread outside of hospitals. I, I, so the hospital I've worked at has sort of gone out of its way to sort of advertise that the doors are open. Oh, really? Uh, explicitly for the reason. Oh, yeah. So it, it, the message certainly from a hospital is not like, don't come here. Um, stay away. We have COVID. In fact, you know, the resources are there and available. And we've been scared that people are self-selecting and staying away. Right. So it's not that we're not that we're ready to help them, but it's more people's own fear of a hospital being a scary place at this time. Um, obviously there's limitations on visitors and the number of people that can come in and everyone having to sort to, to physically distance while in a hospital. But the message that's been tried to be said is, you know, please don't stay away. Right. You know, get the help you need. If you're suffering, you know, whatever it is, you know, chest pain, abdominal pain, please don't wait. Still do what you need to do to get the care that you need. Um, don't let that fear get in the way. So I think it's really, how do, how do you tell people that and have them, you know, take those risks given all the anxiety that's been generated from this. Well, it's just, um, but you're right. Sur- elective, yeah. Elective surgical procedures. They, they've, they've stayed away from 
you know, planned bringing people in and, and deploying the resources towards that thing is a very conscious decision at the moment okay. outside of emergencies. Wow. Yeah. Um, it's, yeah, I mean, how, I mean, okay, so let's, let's move away from your hospital life. Let's talk about anxiety. Um, sure. I've been, like, I've been dealing a lot with anxiety the last three months, just not knowing, just having this kind of hangover you know, because I, 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 in many ways, I'm a bit of a control freak. So may, maybe this makes my anxiety worse. But I normally live a life where, like, I know where I'm going to be almost every day for a whole year. Like, I know where I'm going to yeah. be filming here, and then there's a talk here, and then there's, you know, time with friends here or, or family or, or whatever. And, and everything has just been, like, shattered. Um, and obviously, like, People are losing their jobs. They don't know when their next job is going to come. Everyone I work with and who I hire to do my work with me is a freelancer. And we're all just sitting around being like, when can we get back to work? When can we start earning, you know, a wage again? And, and I just feel like this uncertainty that we're all sitting in um, is, is just terrible. Yeah. It's, so, I mean, again, I think, I think you're giving, that's exactly what I, there's a lot of, you'll, you'll hear people describe anxiety in different ways, yeah. right? For some people, anxiety is a state of restlessness. For some people, it's more of a somatic experience. I feel I'm aware of my chest, I'm, you know, my breathing, I'm, I'm aware of my heartbeat, um, I, or, or somebody else, someone else it's, it's more of an experience of their own thoughts. I've got all these thoughts. I'm thinking about something at the same time. I'm very anxious. But, but to your point, I think of probably one of the easiest definitions of anxiety is an intolerance of uncertainty. Yeah. Right. Is that is that desire to know when the end of something is going to be or what the answer to something is going to be, what the outcome of it is. Um, and for some people, those are very small things. For other people, those are you know more existential questions. And, and for a lot of us, we solve that kind of anxiety by compulsive behavior. Right. I'm going to plan. I'm going to do a to do list. I'm going to think about it. I'm going to you know, all of that kind of stuff are healthy ways of dealing with uncertainty. But I, I, what, what you're describing is, I think, what we're all struggling with is, is the uncertainty and the inability to really put any framework on this, right? We, you know, we're, we're, we're being denied answers because there probably aren't answers yet, and the answers we get are constantly changing. And then if you listen to the CDC or your local public health person or you listen to Donald Trump, you're getting messages all over the place about what the real story is that just screws with that part of your brain trying to say... I understand what reality is and here are the rules to play by and here's what I'm going to do. Uh, so, so for all of us, you know, I, I've seen this among my colleagues, right? You know, you have what the Ontario public health is saying, you hear what the local public health body is saying, the hospital is saying, then you get, you know, Trump or the CDC or you know, the latest research paper coming out of France. And they're all saying slightly different things. And it just leads to conflict and more uncertainty as opposed to a sense of control. And here's how we're going to address it. I mean, for you in terms of money and employment and planning, like, you know, you know, having a small business, the best of time is constant uncertainty. Yeah. I, mean, I mean, you know, I mean, the people I think that struggle the most, you know, when you, when you know people who have small businesses, you never get to turn that off. No. You know, that sense of, of you go home at night and you're still running your business in your head. You don't get your weekends off. You know, you, you know, you're leveraged up, your own life is caught up in that very different than if you're working just a, you know, a job for somebody else with some sort of structure and benefits. It's true. So to add, to take your, your small business, <laughs> which involves throwing yourself out into the wilderness uh, and, and, and provoking that uncertainty, it's, it's so many levels to it. Well, the uncertainty, what I love the uncertainty is, is really fun when you're on camera. Well, what's funny about it is like, I don't know, I don't, I don't know that I can, I, I don't think I can accept that you're an anxious guy. I, I just have to question that very premise. I mean, given what you do, uh, you've got such anxiety tolerance, right? You've got such risk tolerance. You're not someone who's, you know, just sitting at home with a stable life. You're, you're essentially living beyond the, the risk factors that most of us, you know, you know, protect ourselves with. Yeah. So I, I think of you as the exact opposite of an anxious guy who's probably anxious as hell because, you know, you can't throw off the shackles and just and, and do all the fun stuff that you normally do. Yeah, I think I think you're right. I think that's part of it. And you've used analysis of 40 years of knowing. Me. Um, but but <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, I mean, I, you know, I do live a quite risk tolerant life. It's very different than most. Perhaps I don't actually have a physical home. Um, you know, I spend most of my time filming or meeting people and giving talks and stuff like that. And, and yeah, I mean, 
where I think I where I don't get anxious from the same people I think from the same things that other people get anxious from. So like, you know, not knowing where I'm going to be next week or not knowing this or not knowing that doesn't bother me at all. What bothers me is like, you know, when are we going to film again and where is it going to be and, and where, you know, because normally the filming schedule is planned out months and months in advance. Yeah. And um, and that's very frustrating. And then I have my and then, you know, like I'm very lucky I, I'm able to produce television content at, at, at what I believe is a very high level. And but I don't do it by myself. I have editors and camera operators and, you know, musical composers and 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 all these wonderful people who work with me and they're all freelancers. So when I don't work or when I'm not traveling, I have the anxiety of not being able to keep my team together and keep, you know, and running money through the system so that we can keep making the high quality stuff that we love making. And now I'm in a position where some of the guys are, you know, they're on unemployment insurance or some of them are looking at, at, at different um, job opportunities or, or, or even leaving the industry altogether. And this is what's really yeah. frustrating is like you said earlier, like being in film and television is hard at the best of times, but right now it's mm -hmm. just completely destroying. I mean, I, you know, a lot of industries are being destroyed. I understand that a lot of people are losing their lives. I also understand that, but for our specific conversation yeah. today, um, you know, the yeah. amount of people who are in film and television at the end of this is going to be like probably less than half. Yeah. I really believe that. Well, no, I mean, I, again, yeah, I, it's it's horrifying to think about what the impact of this is going to be in a lot of different ways. No. Um, and I think I think that we're, we're all sort of aware of the worst case bit, but which industries get cleaned out and how they rebuild themselves and... Uh, you, know, you know, as as you know, I, I'm a theater guy. I do a lot of improv, and I, I did a lot of theater and undergrad and stuff. And I just I I can't even consider what that industry looks like after this. I mean, film and television, you know, you can start to. I mean, I, I know that Hollywood started of starting to pick up again with some kind of distancing in some way, kind of way. But look, how do you do live theater? How do you go back to to being in a room and a one off performance and and really that it, the, the magic of watching real people interact in front of you? Uh, how do you go back to that? Yeah. And and when will people feel safe that, you know, you go back to like the, thinking of a theater experience and, you know, three seats down, you've got an old woman pulling out her candy in the middle of the performance with a cough and they sort of, you know, coughing into it. And it's just like this world, you know, that those little coughs and the sniffles and, and everything else that you're seeing is going to completely detract from the experience of, uh, of watching the show. What was the, what was uh, the last so, live, what was the last live theater experience you had? Mine was Hamilton in New York, maybe like, Oh yeah, three or three years ago. But yeah, just those little narrow seats that you can barely fit in, and everyone's just shoulder yeah. to shoulder, just watching this amazing performance. And you know that's like gone because there's no way those theaters can break even with those high rents and and you know go, like giving everyone like one person every third seat. Yeah, no, it, it's the same. Right, it's the same thing with what movie theaters are doing. But yeah. that's you know. I'm not as sympathetic towards the movie theater industry, but uh, you know, obviously, I do like that that experience. But but live theater, you know, you you wear a mask and you're going to be like you know one third of the volume in the audience. I agree with you. You can't do the big Broadway performances. So I don't know if that pivots to smaller theaters or you know if you say like, look, a vaccine comes out in November and by January we're all ready to jump back into things exactly the way they are. I don't know. I think it's very hard to predict. And also whose disposable income is ready to throw down on $300 theater tickets. Yeah. Um, I, I was getting excited for Harry Potter and the Cursed Child coming to Toronto. Uh, no, you know, no, no longer. <laughs> was, no, no, I don't know that that's going to happen, especially yeah, you know, how complicated the production is. So. Yeah. It's, it's, um, uh, it's really, it's messed up. But look, another thing, you're one of the most educated yeah. people I know. And, and, I, and not only are you a medical doctor and a psychiatrist, and everything like that but you're a deep thinking guy and we always have really fun conversations when we're together and i always appreciate that and uh we always go out of our our way to see each other and catch up for a drink so i want to ask you sure. when did okay. when did information become so useless like like mm -hmm. i'm i i am so struggling with this um so i mean first few weeks i was watching the news a lot we've talked about this on our last conversation together yeah. but I stopped basically watching the news now I just listen to a podcast every morning and then that's it but I'm like okay. you like I, I I I try to only get my news from like the WHO or the CDC like if I want to know what's going on 
I just go to their websites and I have a look at the country outbreak and how everything's looking and whatever. And then I, I, I disappear. I don't ever go to a news site. So, but, but like you said, every single like platform or broadcaster or even the CDC and WHO, the numbers are so off the chart, different in every direction. And I just like, when did information become useless to the point where it just builds up anxiety in people's minds and doesn't give them any hope or any real decisiveness in, in how to live their lives? Yeah, I think it's a great question. Um, uh, more, of, more of a debate or a so, dialogue. I, I, I don't expect you to be able to answer yeah, that one. <clears throat> Well, no, I used to I used to give this a lot of thought. Um, I, so I used to teach a class at NYU about um, uh, child and adolescence and the impact of media on them. You were teaching you know, at NYU? And trying to understand. I taught at NYU for like about a year and a half, a, a couple of the class a couple of times. I never knew. Um, and it was it was an undergraduate class. But one of the questions, you know, you have, you know, is when you're telling parents how to raise their kids, you know, parenting, you get they get such many different messages, right? Messages from your mother-in-law and your mother and from your pediatrician and the news articles and trying to really what the class became about to my mind was how do you teach people uh, to be savvy about how they read information and review studies and what sources they go to and how to critically think. Um, I don't think our brains, uh, if, if you go back 100 years or 200 years, I don't think that they were sort of naturally built to critically think. And I think the, the, the real question that we all have is we're, we have exposure and access to huge amounts of data. And unless you have a really good filter that you've built up and a really good model of how you process that data, you're going to get, you're going to drive yourself insane because you're it's so easy to see conflicting information that has these sort of sexy storylines. To your point, I, I think of, uh, I think a lot of story. Um, story is kind of an abstract idea, but, but story is how we as human beings it's how we experience the world and ourselves. It's how we process information. When you hear, when you hear data or when you see a news story, there's a way of composing a plot arc that helps communicate an important lesson to us, right? It's, the, it's what Aesop's fables are. Everything is embedded, these little stories. It's how we take things in. And, and if you're not able to sort of both pick apart a story and put a different one back together, um, you just get lost in the stories that are being fed to you. Uh, and especially as this whole process has gone on, there are so many competing stories and different stories and where the danger is and what's going to happen uh, that I, get, I agree with you. Unless you really put some blinders on or you really critically think, if you're not able to just tolerate the uncertainty and you have to stick at it right away into a narrative, it's a completely overwhelming experience. It, it um, is. And a lot of people, this is, I guess, to, to your point, what bothers me a lot is the number of people I've seen in the last couple of months um, and I, and I apologize if there's, this is, this is no specific patient. I would say this is just a general experience I have is that someone comes into my office and they sit down and they look me honestly in the eye and they go, well, I've done my research. And I'm like, oh, you've done your research. Okay. And, and, and that can mean any number of things, but it typically means, you know, typing three words into Google and clicking on the first article that comes up and, and feeling like they have now, you know, accepted an expertise and knowledge base on something. Um, and, and, it's, and it becomes an, an inherently conflictual or a can experience because now someone believes that they've done research, they believe they have the truth, uh, and, and, and the, the depth to which they've done this can, can vary dramatically. Uh, and and you're, you're now arguing with an equal expert. We're now both experts in this particular issue. Uh, it's not, and, and I'm not trying to pretend that I'm doctor, I know everything, but I'm also saying, okay, I might've encountered this problem two or 3,000 times before, and, and your Google search may not quite be comparable to the nuances of what this problem might mean for you. Right. So, um, That's, yeah, that must I, be I agree. I don't think so our goals are for data. That must be yeah. so frustrating. It, it's, I think it's, it's a problem. I mean, again, WebMD and everything over the last 20 years, it's, it's certainly just changed the practice climate. It's, it, you know, it's not so much, you know, you do have a little bit more of a consumer driven experience, I think, when you're practicing medicine, right? It's, right. A little bit more. Well, I've, re I've I've read, and I want this antibiotic, or I want this blood pressure medication, or I I think I have this illness based on the commercial. So so you're competing a little bit with people getting information and data, but also you're trying to provide the the filter or the expertise or the 
you know, aggregating source to say, okay, you know, you do have a little bit of this, but maybe it's not exactly the thing that you were told on TV it is. So when did we all stop yeah. trusting each other? Like, I, I think that's a, like what, well, like, why wouldn't, yeah. like, why wouldn't you're a doctor? Like, if you told me to do something, why would I second guess you? Like, why would I listen to an advertisement that comes on at 1 a.m. after Fox News or CNN? And, and it's not a erectile dysfunction advertisement because that's what they're all about. But why would I not mm -hmm. just listen to my family doctor or the psychiatrist that I go to? You know, like w where does this second guessing nature come in or this desire to, to, to consume these prepackaged concepts in, in advertising and commercials? I mean, this is this is so this is one of the reasons why I just got out of out of mainstream media or out of news work and all that mm -hmm. kind of stuff. Cause I just, I found it so frustrating. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I, I love the idea that everybody inherently should trust a psychiatrist. Yeah. I think probably, uh, <laughs> I think probably you're in the minority. Um, if you consider the psychiatrists to be trustworthy, there's a lot of anxiety in my profession in general, and there's a lot of mistrust in psychiatrists. Yeah. We either prescribe too much medication, the wrong medication. We have some nefarious motive. I mean, I, I laugh with my kids because psychiatrists and in insane asylums crop up so frequently in TV and movies yeah. that I often like have to be like, hey, that there, there's there's someone doing what your dad does, or yep, that's the kind of place dad works at, right. um, because they're often plot points. They're often untrustworthy. Um, you know, I, I think there's there's being smart and being an educated, and I certainly want all my patients to be educated on what it is they're struggling with and what their disorder is, what the treatment options are, and certainly when it comes to therapy, being an educated consumer. Um, uh, you know, but the challenge is, is how do you, you know, how do you make the conversation more sophisticated and more specific to that individual, as opposed to, you know, it becoming an obstacle towards getting them better. Yeah. So, but, you know, you know, it's, it's no longer, look, the doctor is on high and the know-it-all. It's become a far more consumer driven, you know, somebody wants something. I'm just here to get a physical and can you fill out this form for me? And I, I need refill of this. It's a little bit more transactional than it was probably 50 years ago. Yeah. And how does that make you feel so, as your chosen profession, like having to deal with these changes? I mean, I'll, I mean, it's, I find it really fascinating and interesting just not, you know, having that kind of flip on you. Well, I mean, you could play you could play both sides, right? Which is, I think, if you're not up on that pedestal, right? If you're not, you know, you know, God in that situation, um, you also have less responsibility, right? I mean, the, the the counterpart to it is, okay, you know, we're a little bit more of a team, or I am just giving you what you think you need, um, and I may not entirely disagree, but I might have done something slightly differently. And if it turns out that this isn't exactly the right direction, then I can give that feedback perhaps in the future and say, you know what? You remember how I suggested we might go in this direction, but you really felt strongly to go in this one? Well, I think maybe it's time to consider what I'd initially thought would be the right solution to this. No. Uh, so, I mean, I don't think, it, hopefully the relationship isn't ending in that, that first moment. And if it works out well, great. I think the question always is, if it works out not as well, um, how, you know, those kinds of struggles, you know, if I, I think that you have a psychotic illness and you think it's just depression and I'm saying, I think you need an antipsychotic medication. Uh, I don't think you need this antidepressant. You know, th there do become those moments of we're really arguing about the diagnosis, which in mental health, you know, you don't get to point to numbers. No, you don't get to point to here's your psychosis level right here on paper. And, uh, we need to teach, you know, give you a medication to bring down the psychosis. You know, it's a, it's, it's a much more abstract experience. You, you mentioned something earlier, you mentioned something earlier, just about all the, all the mixed messages coming at you and, and like, you know, the federal government will say one thing and then the local government will say another thing. And then these hospitals will be saying something else, like as a medical professional, how are you dealing yeah. with all of this, all of this, mixed information and and how are you processing it and trying to you know explain what's going on if a patient comes in feeling anxiety from covid or has lost yep. their job like how i mean like like how do you how do you explain to them what's going on and that you know it'll all be okay soon kind of thing like are you even doing that um no, I'm doing some of it. I mean, it's interesting to me. I see a lot of people at the moment, they, they come into the hospital and they're wearing masks. And the minute they come into my office, they say, can I take this thing off now? Um, and, and, and in that, in that, well, in that little interaction, you know, the, the, what you realize is this, the person is wearing a mask, 
but they may not be aware of why they're wearing a mask. Oh, yeah. um, and so when they're, when they're asking, you know, can I take this off as if this is me, you know, like, like I've showed up at their house that morning and said, put a mask on, which obviously I haven't. Um, the question becomes, why is that person wearing a mask? What's their own understanding of what it's for? Um, and I, I tend to look, I'm masked up and I've got a face shield, so I'm well protected. Um, but really they're wearing a mask to not spread it to me. You know, that's why they're wearing a mask. You know, I've got the face shield and everything on to both protect myself and also to make sure I don't spread it to them. Uh, so a lot of people, I think, you know, the challenge is, the challenge has always been in public health messages. Um, and how do you tell people across a large population, a really simple bit of information that's not too simple, right? But it's also not too complex. And, and what you see, for example, I mean, if you go back to last year, when you look at the anti-vax movement, there's a lot of criticism about how vaccines have been communicated to the general public over the years. You know, there was a time sort of 30 years ago where you told parents, get your kids vaccinated. It's an inherent good, you know, and it was they did it because they were, these were illnesses that their parents, their grandparents had had. There was a very concrete understanding of what they're for. Um, but over the last 20 years, you see that people don't like to be told what to do. They're not necessarily being told why they're, they're giving their kids the vaccines. They're getting told by a lot of people that these are bad. And, and now the simple message of get your kids vaccinated because you're supposed to do it on a schedule has sort of all fallen apart with lots of paranoia and skepticism. So, so to my mind, I, I think it's a balance of there are messages out to the general public that are really there to reduce the spread of this illness and contain it. And then there's the very specific, okay, you know, with this individual person, you know, what was the exposure risk? How many people do they interact with? How far is a cough? How far do we need to stand? It's really more about the, you know, the treating and assessment of individual patients. You know, and that, that's where Donald Trump's with, a, you know, the hydroxychloroquine or all of this sort of, you know, you know bec become completely lost. You, you know, you can't just say to a whole population, get on this drug, you know, so for some people, it's going to kill them. Mm -hmm. For other people, they have, you know, what stage of the illness should they be treated with? All those nuances get lost when you oversimplify things. Yeah. Um, and and, and, that, that's and where spreading I that globally challenges. and spreading that yeah. globally, which is terrifying. Well, that's exactly right. Because if you see like, look, you look at what Sweden's doing and then you look at what's happening in, in Italy or in Spain or in Germany, and you look at, you know, what, you know, China and, and Hong Kong and how they've approached this, you've got so many different images of what the right thing to do is. And there's specific reasons and different, you know, populations, who's compliant and who's not, mm -hmm. what resources they have, what the culture is like, what the geography is like. Um, but in our, our brains can't process any of that. All we see is chaos and confusion and why aren't we and we should be, but what's the right thing? And as you said at the beginning, it, it's, it's the tolerance of uncertainty uh, in, in this world of uncertainty. And, and what's right for Norway is probably not what's right for downtown New York. And, uh, how do you, how do you accept that that's true without inherently questioning it and scrapping the whole thing and, and getting over emotional about it? That's the, that's the other yeah. thing that I just can't handle. Like every time I go and accidentally see a news, you know, report a video, for example, like yeah. a, a television news report, I just, I just see these presenters or these journalists with just so much passion for their you know, yeah. yay or nay position on this one issue. And like, when, yeah. like, when did news stop being objective? And when, like, when did we stop like building some consensus before we blurted our, our version of it out into the world? Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I think, look, I mean, especially in the era of, of, uh, you know, black lives matter and everything that's going on in the United States. I mean, oh. I think there's, there's a good point to point out that the news has never been objective, right? I mean, you know, the, the, the days of here, we have 30 minutes to cover what the top stories are. You know, that's a very selected approach to objectively covering all the important issues, you know, and which ones get dropped quickly and how much time is devoted. And uh, there's always been selection in terms of that. But I agree with you. It's never been the entertainment bit of let's let's sit in front of one news channel for all day and hear the same messages, you know, being to, you know, as entertainment, uh, which, which it's turned into. And certainly. then, and so. then being so stressed out by what you see that you're, you're stress eating or you're stress smoking yeah. or you're drinking too much alcohol or you're beating your kids or beating your wife. Like the stuff that's coming out of South Africa, holy shit. I mean, I mean, I've been interviewing yeah. some South African people, but I was listening to my uh, podcast this morning, BBC, BBC podcast and they were just saying like 
violence against women during the lockdown was through the oh. roof and um yeah and it's been terrifying what's been going on there because people are in a stressful situation they don't have any personal space and and yeah. and uh you know bad things have been happening and that just is a terrible situation yeah no i mean that's you know i i've seen you know a fair amount of that and then interestingly also seeing you know not you know, depending on how you feel, but just seeing the the perpetrators of the, the that violence as well, yeah. right? Seeing the individuals who are, you know, essentially, you know, not not justifying their behavior, but essentially whatever it is, you know, they've lost their job, they've lost their income, they are stressed out, they have this has completely overrode their ability to cope with it, and and obviously other people are suffering, and you know, often finding themselves in you know increasingly dire situations as a result of the criminal charges and everything else, so. Um, and have you had to recognize have you had in, to analyze people like that? Have you had to have you had to talk to people who have committed these kinds of crimes? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I wouldn't say I analyze them, but certainly, absolutely. I mean, I, I see you know a fair amount of suicidal men um, after criminal charges in domestic violence situations, right? Yeah. Um, or, or for that matter, drunk driving, um, any kinds of, of of behavior. You know, men are not tend not to be particularly you know psychologically minded. They're going to sort of act out their feelings. Uh, not dissimilar to a lot of teenagers and children, right? Um, they're not coming in to ask for help and everything else like that. But I, I certainly, I see a lot of, and then men act on those feelings towards suicide, right? So they, they tend not to be coming and asking for help. They, they make their decision to, to, to hang themselves or other things. So um, it's, uh, it's, it's the stress level on everyone and how it manifests itself is going to just ricochet back and forth in lots of different ways. So Yeah. And, and what's the, I mean, what's it been like in Canada? Like, I mean, has the social safety net worked? I mean, obviously there's people falling through the cracks, but, you know, do you feel yeah. like the average stress level of what people are going through is as intense as what's happening in the United States where like 40 million people filed for employment in one month, like yeah. randomly like that. And, and, and of those, you know, three of my part-time staff were of that 40 million. Um, yeah. And, uh, and I mean, are we seeing something like that in Canada? Are you seeing people like on edge even before the, no, even before the, you know, the, the racial riots started, I mean, people in the United States were kind of bursting at the seams already. And this, and this, yeah. all this police violence and stuff like that is just putting people right over the top. And, 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 you know, it's just, I mean, what's going to be next? I mean, I mean, you know, racial injustice has been a problem for centuries, you know, like there could be something that comes next that's bigger than that because everyone's still just on edge and, you know, pissed off because they've lost jobs and they're suffering from so much un yeah. unknown anxiety. No, I mean, it's funny. I, I think back, I remember when I, so I, I lived in, uh, in Boston, New York between 94 and uh, 2011. So 17 years. And I remember, you know, so my first couple of years in the States, I, I sort of, I was like, uh, the United States is not like, is, is not this unified global power that I sort of thought it was going to be. I was like, it's so fractured and it's so conflicted underneath the surface when you're sort of living there. And, and you know, I, I sort of thought like, you know, there's an expiry date on this place. Like this is not, the center is not going to hold in the United States for so long. Is that why you moved back and, to and Canada? Fact, no, well, it, it was, look, I'll, I'll be honest, I mean, part of the reason moving back to Canada was, was you know, stable health care. I mean, uh, at the time, my wife and I, uh, she was doing the health care through, because I, I had a small private practice, which I could do in New York, but all of our benefits and health care was through her. Um, and essentially, she was not happy at the place that she was working. And we went on to Cobra, which was a huge expense each month to essentially pay for bad health care, in which you also have to pay for all these co-pays and deductibles. And uh, we were pregnant with our second child and decided, no, we're just, we're just not, can't do this anymore. Yeah. Um, so, so I, to, to your question originally, I mean, because healthcare isn't going to be ripped away if you lose your job, I mean, Canada is going to be inherently more stable. And to be honest, I've seen these interesting group of like 19 to 25 year olds that weren't terribly employed before this whole thing went down. And, and a couple of people have said to me, I've got more money in my bank account than I've had in three, four years. Yeah. Because, you know, with the CERB checks and everything, they, they have cash that they essentially didn't have. Um, I don't know they were, that they were looking terribly hard for employment, but they do have at least some money to float things. I think it's very different for, you know, for, for 
people more towards my age were trying to support families where the CERB check is not going to float things for very long or for small business owners, people who have, you know, been in the process of buying property or planning to sell their home for a lot of money. Um, some of those financial binds are just terrible. So are there stories coming um, out about people so, like that in Canada at the moment? I, I, you know what, I mean, to your point, I, I wouldn't say I've been watching the news. I, I've sort of my, my, I go to work, I, I see the people who kind of wash up on the shores, of the emergency room. I see the people who need acute follow up. And, you know, that's been my window into how people have been, you know, that's a very select group. Uh, so I don't know, I think you can always go to the anecdotes to put a story together. But the question is, you know, it'll, it'll take a couple of years to compile what the overall narrative is of what the impact has been. So one of the challenges of not just choosing anecdotes and, and filling the world with just that story repeatedly, um, but not being able to know which anecdotes are most true at the moment is the challenge. I'm, 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 I'm so confused by it all, you know, because China's just had a second outbreak in, in Beijing city, the capital, and they're blaming, blaming it on, I don't know, like fish or something like foreign fish. Like when, this is an impossible question. I'm not asking you an impossible question, but I'd love to have a dialogue. No. When is the when is the greatest investigative reporter that we have on our planet going to start figuring out where this came from and why and how? Like we are now, you know, four, five, six months into this. You know, the Italians yeah. just figured out like that people were getting sick with COVID in in Italy in in December. Um, yeah. You know, like when is someone who is incredibly thorough and incredibly diligent going to just dedicate their entire life to figuring out what the hell happened well i mean i i think probably that moment has passed i, I think i think there i mean you you had in the in the early stages of this probably every virology lab in the whole you know in the whole planet yeah trying to get their hands on this and looking at and trying to answer various questions of it and certainly there, there are a lot of coronavirus experts that I think feel pretty comfortably saying where this came from. Mm -hmm. I think, to be honest, the real challenge is going to be China, you know, because if this did, I mean, I think that the general consensus is that it came from somewhere in China, whether it was that exact market or anything else like that. But I don't know that the Chinese are transparently going to ever share what they knew and what the what the metrics of this looked like to a degree that we're all satisfied. Right. Yeah. You know, I don't know. Maybe some archive gets opened up in 20 years, but I'd be surprised if they would keep such an archive. But I, I don't know the inner work. You, you know better than I do. I mean, just how much China, how much do they, they they're going to ever share about this? Well, this is the thing. It's like it's like, why do we have international institutions? And why do taxpayer dollars go to international institutions? Like you as a Canadian citizen pay tax in Canada. Canada helps fund the WHO. The United States yep. used to fund the WHO and they withdraw funding and stuff like that. But I just feel like this is the moment where the WHO should be leading the charge and, and telling everyone globally how best to act and producing yeah. regular statements about information that's coming out and where this came from. And they should be the people doing these analysis. And, and I just feel like they've gone silent. And it's shocking because the, the lack of global leadership at this moment in our lives is so obvious to me. And I don't know yeah. if people are really following it. Like, you know, in times of trouble, you've, you know, you've had the United States taking the charge, right or wrong. But like right now, yep. everyone is just shrinking back from this. And it's just letting more garbage proliferate through the news system, confusing everyone. And, and I just yep. feel like, like, why can't one country, one politician, one journalist, why can't one person try to just be the voice of what's happening at the moment? And, and, and it's, uh, it's shocking because like, I mean, like you said, yeah, coronavirus would have been different 20, 30 years ago when you only had like three major English language news stations or, or we were all just tuning into the BBC. Like you're right. Lots of other stories wouldn't have made it, but, but the, the news that we were getting would have been condensed and, and more focused. And I just find today's media landscape and the lack of leadership 
so frustrating and confusing. Well, I mean, I think what it's it's interesting. I mean, you, you, what you're yearning for, right, is a simplicity to this whole situation, right? No, what no, you're no. Almost saying no, no, is no. like it can be totally fucked up. Mm-hmm. Like the whole situation can be fucked up, and we can be like. This is going to last for 30 years. But I want to have like one person tell me that. Like, and it should, it yeah. should be like so, something to do with the United Nations because that's why we created the United Nations to help deal with global governance or global communications or global problems. And if it's not going to be the UN, then it should be our global superpower, which we've all kind of signed on to. Like the, the fact that these two institutions are just hiding from taking any leadership in this situation I find very frustrating. Yeah. Well, I mean, you got to remember, I mean, I, I, I agree with you. I mean, look, I'm a big Star Trek fan, right? And the idea of like the United Federation of Planets and, you know, Starfleet and everyone follows, you know, it's like this, you know, persistent utopia and everyone just does their job and there's some sort of organizing body. I think there's something comforting that idea. Yeah. But, but look at what happened with Brexit, right? I mean, look at the skepticism of the EU, yeah. right? The, the UN has not really been at the forefront of anything for, for decades, probably since it was, you know, the League of Nations coming out of World War II and everything like that, right? It was like, like some sense of wanting there to be a government, but also not wanting that party, to, you know, that power to ever tell you what to do. And, it, you know, if you look at like the, 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 you know, international courts, you know, like the United States and China are never really going to, or Russia are never really going to be follow, follow what they're told by an outside body. Oh. And if you look at the United States, it's like, you know, you have towns that won't listen to the state or the state that won't listen to the federal government. So, you know, the idea of wanting leadership that unites and supersedes everything, I, I think we, we all kind of wish for, but um, I don't know that, I don't think that humans can tolerate that. I think at the end of the day, we all sort of are very self-involved. And so if, if what someone very abstractly is telling us to do, and we don't know who that person is, I think we become skeptical. We, we start to push back. You know, you're talking about an entity that we'd have to have such trust in that if the WHO said, Ryan Pyle, you're staying inside for the next week, you'd be, okay, yes, WHO, you know me and you know what's best for me. I will do that. But that, that's hard to sustain over time and not screw it up and not start to get conspiratorial and paranoid about. Well, that's it. I mean, um, that's it. I mean, it's the same thing about trusting your your psychiatrist. I mean, it's the same thing about yeah. <laughs> about about trusting anyone. Like, you know, this is yeah. this is where it is. Like, the trust in government institutions. I mean, we were gonna. I didn't know we were gonna go this way, but I'm going. Like, the trust in government institutions in the last 20 years, with the proliferation of social media and the proliferation of multiple news outlets, has gone through the roof. And now, no one trusts anyone, and no one trusts anything they read. But there's more information yep. out there than ever before. And now everyone is just confused and angry. And I think we're more self-involved now than we've ever been before. Now, I wasn't alive during World War II, but in the textbooks I read, which were probably American, North American slanted <laughs> anyways, seemed to kind of yep. indicate that the whole country was kind of behind going to war and the factories all like reconditioned their car, you know, manufacturing lines and or microwave men to make bullets and tanks and whole thing. And like, it seemed like there was a real, like, we're going to do this together kind of thing. And right now everyone's just telling everyone else to fuck off and, and, mm. and enough. And it's, and, and, you know, we're supposed to be social distancing and, and no one's doing anything. And now, I mean, just as an example, the whole Southern United States is, is, is kind of, you know, oh. blowing up because, because they thought they were fine forever. And, and look, I mean, I think we got to be careful because, you know, certainly it's a sexy story to say something like the entire southern United States is doing its own thing. But right, I mean, right. th- there's still lots of people down there, you know, that are, are uh, you know, there, there's people everywhere that are pushing back. There's probably 80 percent of people anywhere that are sort of doing what they're supposed to do. And then there's 10 percent on either side. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, so so I, mean, I think that there's, there's probably a lot of people still doing what they're they're supposed to do. But there are also people dramatically and flagrantly violating everything that they're told to do but it's the supposed to do that is the question like cdc who donald trump uh, actual doctor listening to my cousin like who do you who do who do you listen to (laughs) like i mean i've this has been one of the most frustrating things because i'm gonna i'm gonna get on an airplane in in four weeks or six weeks to fly to europe or maybe i'll drive i haven't decided yet but like you know, am I going to go in a full body suit? Um, am I just going to be wearing gloves and a mask? Like, what's the 
you know, who do you listen to for protocol? It's, um, yeah. it's shocking. And all these companies are trying to, all these companies for commercial reasons are trying to reassure us that going back out into public is safe. And I don't want to be like, you know, I don't want to be a, a conspiracy theorist, but they don't necessarily have the right motives for this kind of thing. Like, you know, and, and this is just one example. So AMC no. two days ago, the, the big movie theater chain in the United States, two days ago, they came out and yeah. said, we will not require people to wear masks in the movie theater. And then less than 24 hours later, they came out and rescinded that statement and said, you will have to wear a mask when you come to the theater. And it's just because they don't want to have people wear masks in the theaters if it makes them uncomfortable because they're going to buy less popcorn and they're, they're just going to have less ticket sales. So I guess. Well, I mean, look, I think, you know, I, I, I can also, though, if you, if you play back that timeline, I think if they come out and said, we, re, we require masks for you to come to the movie theater, I think there's a non-zero chance that, that would, they would have been targeted by a lot of anti-mask wearing individuals, potentially with fire burning or looting, right? I, I think that whoever steps out in front and takes the position that is, you know, the sane one, you, you do run the risk of inflaming the, the sort of the irrationally uh, the, the looters or the, the dem demonstrators of that to say, okay, we're going to burn down this AMC because they're, they're just, you know, they're just leftist, you know, they're just doing what they're sheeple or whatever, you know, the whole language is going to be about, uh, they're not questioning what the, what things are. Looter, I, looters, see, you know, looters and people setting fire to things. This is our fear at the yeah. moment. It's like, if I say something wrong on Twitter, people are going to loot yeah. and burn my business establishment. Yeah. I mean, again, it's, it's, you know, six months ago, it was people are going to just put a lot of really mean comments on me and, you know, and, but, but now it's like, we're going to dox you and we're going to burn down your, your business. Um, so to go back a second to your point, I mean, um, I mean, again, I think the important thing is for you to understand what the risk is that you're worried about. Sure. You know, if you're going to fly mm -hmm. or not fly, are you worried about, getting the virus? Are you worried about passing it on? Is there another illness that you're worried about? And, and simply just being able to balance that risk. You know, it's, it's about judiciously what you're going to do to protect yourself. But I think you make, um, you make an interesting point. Um, I think it's important to consciously choose what you're going to listen to and how you're going to frame things. There's, there's a great uh, speech that David Foster Wallace gave years ago called This is Water um, that, that's on YouTube. And someone even sort of did a whole uh, sort of a, turned it into a kind of a short film. Um, but I think it's a great, it talks you through in some ways the choice that we all make uh, of not working on autopilot, right? And if autopilot is just blindly following the fears of what you're told, um, but, but, but choosing how you're going to frame the experiences you have, especially the ones that are scary or that frustrate you, you know, and can you, can you come up with a competing narrative that frees you from feeling trapped and angry and depressed? but also feeling liberated or, you know, grateful uh, or humble or other experiences that say, you know what, this isn't just about me being bossed around or pushed around, but this is me consciously choosing uh, to do something for someone else or to feel good about this and, and not just get trapped and anxious and frustrated. Cause that's, I think in the moment that is the default setting for all of us, you know, just the confusion and the uncertainty and the skepticism. It's, it's very easy for us to just regress and become blindly angry and want to burn things down and want to trash everybody. But it's much harder to say, hey, these, these are people doing their best to, to keep an, a whole economy up and running and allow free movement of people and reuniting of families and economic opportunities. And the answers are going to be 75% right and changing week by week. But uh, how do I accept that and not think terribly of them and, and get too caught up in my own fear? Yeah, no. Hey buddy, um, we're we're out of time. That went so time. fast. You know what? You're my 72nd interview chat Sheesh. call, and uh, without these, I would have been in a much darker place. So I appreciate that. I oh. appreciate it. I'm gonna get to 100 and then stop. That's my goal. Okay. The, well, look, you know, I'm around if you need another one, but it looks like you've got a, quite an array of guests that that far supersede my, me. So, uh, no. but you need me, I'm on standby. Someone cancels, you let me know. Okay. All right. Thanks, boss. I appreciate your time. Take care. Stay healthy. Stay safe. Cool. Bye -bye. Safe travels, man. Thanks. Okay, everyone. That was my uh, cousin, who's also a psychiatrist. His name is Dr. Jeremy Butler. And uh, that's my third COVID call with him. I always love catching up with him. 
Uh, he puts me at ease and we talk a little psychiatry. We talk a little politics. We talk a little just what the hell is going on in the world. And we always end up having a good time. So um, if you guys are loving these COVID calls, they are all on my YouTube channel, which is just Ryan J. Pyle. And there you will find Tough Rides as well. Thank you, everyone. See you guys soon. Bye-bye.